Hi everyone, happy St. Patrick's Day and welcome to tonight's presentation. I'm glad so many of you decided to join us tonight. Uh, tonight we are joined by someone I'm sure many of you already know, Montgomery Countryside Alliance board member and local historian, Kenny Scholes. Reminder, please remain muted during the presentation. You can send any questions you have throughout in the chat. And as always, there will be an opportunity at the end to unmute for Q&A. Thank you to tonight's featured sponsor, the R. Edwin and Winsome S. Brown Foundation. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, make sure to check out our website and register to join us again next week. Without further ado, Kenny, take it away. All right, thanks, Dottie. Um, let me see. Can you let me share my screen? Doesn't seem like it's letting me. Yes, one second. You should be able to now. Yep, yep got it. Thanks. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody can see that now. Let me know if you can't, but um, good to be with you all again. I see, I think, all familiar faces uh, on online, so that's that's really great. Good to see you all back here. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, it, for those of you who haven't heard me talk before. Um, I'm Kenny Scholes. I live here in Poolsville and I've been exploring old homes in the area through a bunch of different lenses over the last couple of years. Um, and um, tonight what I wanted to talk about was some of the kind of architectural features associated with a bunch of the really, I think, interesting old homes here in the Ag Reserve. And I would say up front, if anybody is participating and they have a background as an architect or um, anything in that realm, please forgive me for anything that I say that is incorrect. I am certainly not an architect. I've spent a lot of time the last couple of days looking through um, a bunch of different publications to try to get this as accurate as possible, but it's, it's very possible I might get something wrong. So if that is the case, please feel free to um, correct me either on the spot or at the end. I'm more than happy to, to um, be corrected by somebody who knows better. So, you know, I think as I was over the last couple of days thinking about what I wanted to talk about and then deciding that I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, kind of the architectural design and the evolution of, of home architecture here in the Ag Reserve, one of the things that I kept kind of thinking about is why why does this matter why like even for myself why should I really even care about whether a home is Victorian or from the Georgian period or what the brick structure looks like on the side of the house and I, I think where I've landed is that you know obviously in the grand scheme of things it probably is not that significant or important um, but I think very much like art or like written word, as I've stated here, um, the, the choices that architects and builders made through the last couple of centuries here in the Ag Reserve were all by design, pun intended. Um, they, you know, they were intentional and they reflected the different trends that were prevalent in, in the region at those times. They also kind of reflected the the wealth and the status of, of the homeowner who was having the home built. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it's on some level, it's just really about appreciating these old places and really kind of being able to appreciate them on a, on a next level, admire the, the, the craftsmanship that went into a lot of these amazing homes. I mean, to, to think about some of these places that have been standing for, you know, almost 250 years now, um, that's pretty impressive when you think about it. And um, so certainly, and especially given, you know, the, the relative lack of, of tools and equipment that, that builders in those times had compared to us today, um, you know, I think it's, it's worth some time to, to study their work a bit. Uh, also, and just on a side note, you'll sound really cool when you um, are sitting, you know, outside of locals drinking coffee this weekend and you say to somebody at the table how much you admire the, the cornice work on the old home there. And they have no idea what you're talking about, but you're gonna sound really smart and maybe a little bit pretentious, but that's okay. Okay, so before talking about specific homes, which I'm going to do in specific kind of architectural 
periods. What I wanted to do is kind of just do a quick um, note on some of the architectural features because you'll see these terms throughout and I just want to make sure everybody's kind of generally familiar with what they are. Some of these might be review for some of you. Um, a lot of them were new for me, frankly. So the first is cornice. And so when we say cornice, that is essentially, you can see in the upper left-hand um, picture, that's the, the Joseph White House built in 1824. And it's got really beautiful cornice work, which is kind of that, that part where the wall hits the roof line. And a, and a lot of these old homes, especially um, federal and Georgian style houses, which we're gonna talk about, they are decorated cornices. And normally these decorations are called dentals. Um, you know, in a lot of homes here in Poolsville and really throughout the Ag Reserve, they almost look like teeth. They, they are um, essentially bricks kind of pulled out in kind of patterns. And you'll see that it's on some of these pictures. Um, the, the cornice work with the, the dentals here at the, um, the Joseph White House are actually quite ornate um, and, and some of the nicest I've seen um, in these parts. Below that, we have lintels. So lintels are kind of the, the supporting structures that sit above, typically above windows and doors. Um, on a lot of federal homes, they are just brick, but kind of um, facing in different directions. And in some places, like here, the Beer Stevens house, which as hopefully you all can, can recognize, this is the locals um, cafe location before all of the work was going on there. Um, but here was a <laughs> painted that lentil work um, white, so it kind of stands out. In the upper right, we have the Nathan Pool House. And the feature that I'm highlighting here is called uh, coins. I had to look that up online to make sure I'm saying that right. And they are both a um, aesthetic and structural kind of design element. So the aesthetic is, you know, you can see kind of these large, almost interlocking blocks. Um, in this case, they are painted different than the rest of the house really to kind of stand out as an ornamental feature. Uh, but they also serve a, an important role structurally in kind of keeping walls together and keeping corners tight on old places. And then finally in the bottom right, um, this is from uh, the, um, I think it's, I believe it's the Greenwood house. Um, these are what we would call transom windows. So, so those windows that you see on a bunch of old houses next to the doors and above are, are called transoms. Um, so the ones on the side, normally you'll see them referred to as side transom windows. Sometimes you'll see them referred to as transom lights. Um, and then above, uh, there's a, a, you know, this above transom window. In this case, it's, it's kind of a, a fan shaped window design, similar to what you see above um, in the upper left there at the, uh, the Joseph White House, that fan design above the front door. Is there a question? I see someone raised a hand. I don't know if there's a question. If there is, feel free to shout it out. Tom, feel free to either leave your question in the chat or unmute and ask. Okay, well, I'll, I'll keep going, um, but feel free to stop me at any point. So, so the other thing that I wanted to point out is, and I, I think this is one of those things that is super into the weeds. Um, I think it's cool though, because it's almost like a little unwritten language on old homes that 99.9% .9 of people are going to pass right by every single time and not even notice. But even the way that the bricks were laid um, connotate a certain level of, of status and, um, and, and a little bit of, of um, the time period. Um, and so you can see kind of on the left this diagram of these different brick patterns that you might see on homes. And if we think about a brick, if you were to hold a brick up in front of you and look at it from the side, the long side of it um, is called the, the stretcher. And then the, the short little blocky side is going to be called the header. And so what you have here is kind of these, these different patterns where stretchers and headers are kind of used in, in, in different sequences. Um, so if we look at the Vera Stevens house in the upper left picture, uh, what we're seeing up there is, is common bond. Right? And so the common bond pattern is where you have um, typically a, a row of all headers 
And then normally it's five to seven rows of stretchers and then another row of headers, right? And so it's kind of this pattern. Um, and, and what's kind of interesting about the Veers Stevens house is on the, that upper left picture, that's the side of the house. And the bottom left picture is the front of the house. And on the bottom left, it's running bond. So it's all stretchers. This is what you see normally on new houses. This is kind of a, a newer pattern, which could have been done for a couple of reasons. It could indicate that the brickwork on the front of the Vera Stevens house was um, you know, redone at a later date than when it was initially constructed in the 1840s. Or it could be that for whatever reason, the owner of the home at the time decided that he wanted to, the front um, of, of the home to appear somewhat different in pattern than the sides, which a lot of times we see when we see homes that are built out of stone, we see the best stone used for the front and then kind of more um, rough hewn stone used on the sides and the back. So it's some kind of design choice. I'm not exactly sure of the reason in this case, but, but interesting to see. And then in the upper right, we have um, the Dr. Thomas Pool House. And you can see um, this is what's referred to as Flemish bond, where it's the row of those headers and then above it, it's the stretchers. And then above that, it's the headers just back and forth, right? So kind of a different pattern than that, that kind of uh, common bond form. And then again, if we look at the bottom right, this is, this is the, um, the Jameson real estate building. This is right on the side, you know, that, that whole building is brick, but it's painted white. And um, again, you've got another example of, of common bond there. And so it's just, you know, it's one little interesting detail that as you are up close to old homes, start paying attention to, and you'll see um, different design choices in the way that um, builders decided to lay bricks. Okay, so what I wanna do now is kind of talk through a couple of different architectural styles and, and the time period in which they're in and then provide some specific examples from here in the Ag Reserve to kind of illustrate what that looks like. And the, and the thing that, that I think is really important, and this is something I've really come to appreciate in the last few days looking through some of the work here, is that while these different styles and periods have certain, I, I would almost call them characteristics, um, they are definitely not hard and fast rules. And so what we, what we end up seeing here, especially when we get later on into the late 18th, uh, 1800s, is a number of homes being built that are maybe predominantly one style, but then incorporate a lot of other characteristics of different styles, right? So there's, there's, there's a couple of examples of it, you know, this is just a pure federal home, or this is pure Victorian. But in most cases, what we have is maybe a federal home with some Victorian features or some Italianate or Gothic features, right? And so just, just keep that in mind that as, we, as, you, as you are looking at an old home and thinking about the different characteristics, you know, sometimes trying to just put the house into one bin is not possible because different design elements have been put into play. Or like we see a lot of times, you've got a house built maybe in the Georgian style in the early 1800s, but then it's remodeled in the early 1900s and they put some kind of weird, you know, gothic element to it, right? That doesn't really match the initial style, but now as a result, the home kind of looks like a little bit of a mismatch. Okay, so, so the first style I wanna talk about is, is what's called the Tidewater style. And typically when you, when you look online for Tidewater style, what you're gonna see is a lot of homes that look very, um, you would recognize them as being kind of like from New Orleans. They're kind of that deep south on the water, on the bayou type, um, type structure. The Tidewater style here in this part of Maryland really kind of comes out of PG County. As settlers were moving west towards the Potomac, they were building these homes. And um, they're, they are more simplistic than some of those New Orleans style houses that you might see. Um, these, these homes, you know, in the 1700s, it was all about, you know, utility, right? It's about a, a place for, for warmth, a, a place to stay dry, um, enough rooms to, to sleep and to cook and do things like that. So it's very utilitarian here. Um, but what you'll see is when we look at the Tidewater style, some of the really common features are some really steep or steep, uh, pitched roofs, uh, large chimneys and in many cases, double chimneys. Um, and then typically, you know, the front facing element of the home is normally only three um, kind of bays wide. So two windows and a door. Um, 
So this, this home is called Mount Pleasant. This was built, I believe, in 1797 by Alexander Whitaker. And Whitaker was, was the tax assessor in this area. He owned a lot of land. And as you can see here on, on the left there, this picture is from the 1930s. What, what he did was he built this front home in this Tidewater style. And then back behind it is actually another structure there. You can kind of see the chimney covered in moss, but um, that was a, a stone structure that was the, the separated summer kitchen from the house. Over time, what happened was a breezeway was built connecting the two structures. And so that's kind of what you see in the middle there. Um, but you can really get a sense of kind of this Tidewater architecture here. If we, if we look at kind of the way that the roof is pitched and not only how it's pitched, but even how the, the rear part of the roof is almost longer than the front. We've got kind of that three bay wide structure. And then we have this double chimney feature, which is really kind of an interesting look. It's, it's not common in these parts. I haven't seen a ton of them. But the only other place that I can think of that looks really, really similar to me, um, not that one, is the John Poole House. So the next time that you're sitting at Locals and you're looking at the John Poole House, um, look at the, you'll be looking right at the side of the building. You'll notice it also has that double chimney structure. You can't see it in this picture. I should have chosen a better one, but there is two chimneys and it looks um, I identical um, to, to this, this structure that you see here on the, from the side. Um, unfortunately, this Mount Pleasant home, the front part of it actually caught fire and largely burned down and, and had to be demolished in the 1960s. And so what you have now is the summer kitchen back there is still standing, but this front part is long gone. This home is um, a, a log structure that is um, out in the, the Boyd's area, um, built around the same time as um, the, the John Poole House and Mount Pleasant, largely in the, in the 1790s. And I just, I wanted to show this picture um, because I think this side profile does a really good job of kind of illustrating what I was talking about where you have um, kind of that steeply pitched roof uh, where the backside is even longer than the front. And I believe in a lot of these homes, um, part of the reason for that is kind of this back portion, you can almost see how it's a little bit separate from the front part of the house was actually used as like a, like a tool shed or maybe even had livestock in it at some point. Um, so that's a good example there. And then you've got, again, similar features on, on the John Poole House. And, and obviously, like for the John Poole House, what I would say is this, the, the white clapboard part, um, I believe, was added onto after the initial structure. So when we think about kind of that stereotypical three bay wide piece to these Tidewater homes, we do have, have that here with the log portion. It's just it's been added onto. And then we have the, the Georgian style. So this, this style um, was really came to the Americas in the 1700s and lasted into around the 1830s, um, named for um, uh, the, the King Georges, one through the third. Um, and really, I, I think the best way to characterize the Georgian style is through symmetry. Um, it's, it's largely blocks that are, that are symmetrical. Um, and let's see, so we have this home here. This is, this is friends advice. This is out in, in the Boyd's area. This is, um, uh, off of Buck Lodge road. And what you can see here is as, as we look at this home, I mean, there's this, this clear symmetry on Georgian homes. What we typically have is the door, um, being centered. On this on the structure right so so some of these other places you'll see in the federal style are to the left or to the right this one is typically to the center and that's normally a, an indicator of a georgian home um another another somewhat frequent um appearance is those dormer windows up top uh, on georgian period homes i'm not completely sure that in this case those dormers were there when this structure was initially built in the 1800s they could have been added on later um, but they are somewhat in line with um, with the Georgian architecture. And then on the interior, um, there's, you know, from from what I can tell, a sense that some of the the finished details on the interior of the home are a bit um, more um, kind of like blunt and in your face than than in the in the federal style, right? They're they're kind of larger. And um, so so sometimes one of the things that I've just found is, distinguishing the difference between these Georgian style homes and some of the federal style homes, which we'll talk about in a minute, to me feels 
nearly impossible. And my guess is that there are occasions where you could have architects arguing over like, oh, is this federal or is this Georgian? Um, but um, from, from what I can tell, sometimes the distinguishing features are actually from, from the interior and not the exterior. So a lot of times what you see on the exterior of a Georgian home is gonna look really, really similar to what you might see on a federal home. This is another example. Um, this is this is Aix la Chapelle. So if if you get a chance to to go out to Landmade Brewery uh, this weekend, the new brewery that opened up, it is on the property of, of Aix la Chapelle, built in 1812. This is um, the main block of the home, and it's another example of um, you know it, it it kind of defines all those features I just talked about: the symmetry, the central door, the dormers. The dormers were definitely not original in this case. I know that for a fact, um, but they were added on to later. And um, one, of the, one of the interesting things that I've kind of seen is typically Georgian homes don't have, and we talked about those side transom lights or transom windows next to the, next to the main front door. You don't see them here. Um, a, most of the Georgian homes that I've seen do not have those those windows. I've seen some that do, so it's not a rule again, but but that seems to be one of the distinguishing features that I've come across, at least in this part of the Ag Reserve. And then this is Chiswell's Inheritance, built in 1796. So this is um, Stephen Newton Chiswell built this home. I've talked about this one at length. I think it's arguably one of the most important homes um, in the Ag Reserve. Um, really kind of starts the, the lineage of the Chiswell family, which was a really wealthy family in these parts. Um, I, I think, you know, you, this is another case where you would have individuals maybe argue that it's, it's federal home, which fine. Um, the reason I think it looks Georgian is we've got this central door. We've got no transom side lights. Um, notice kind of those cool brickwork lintels over the windows and over the front door. Um, and then obviously kind of that, that symmetry and very sharply pitched roof there on the front. Okay, so, so that, that Georgian period, again, stretches from the 1700s into kind of the, the first 20 or 30 years of the 1800s. The federal style kind of overlaps with it a little bit and kind of picks up and, and continues on. And the, the federal style um, is, you know, it's it's thought to be kind of tied to American independence and this kind of growing belief um, of in in kind of the American form of of government and democracy, and that's kind of where the the federal um, part of it gets its name. Uh, it, it shares, as I mentioned, a ton of similar features with Georgian. I, I think it's 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 really clear. It's kind of just like an evolutionary you know change from Georgian to to federal style. Um, and I've even seen a lot of Georgian homes described as like, oh, the central block is federal in nature, right? So, which is weird. But so there's, there's a whole lot of overlap here. Um, so, so here's Inverness. And I think this, uh, this picture, and I just got access to a bunch of old pictures from the 30s and 40s of Inverness um, the other day. But this is the old home um, built by the White family out um, in, in the Dickerson area. Uh, in 1818, and it is it is pretty much a textbook example of of federal architecture. Um, we can see here kind of just the really clear symmetry throughout on both sides. I mean, it's absolutely identical on both ends. Um, we have the door, and in this case, off center with the front porch. Really, kind of stereotypical design elements that are that are associated with with the federal structure. Again, you know, you can see a lot of similarities to um, to the Georgian architecture, like I showed you. And just to kind of show you what this house looks like from a little bit further zoomed out, this is another one of those pictures that I just got access to. This is from from 1942, and so you can see again, kind of that that symmetry there and that front porch. Um, one of the really kind of cool things about this picture is if you look in kind of towards the bottom left there, you see that little like cinder block, or it's not even a cinder block; it's a stone block. Um, that was actually to help individuals get up onto their horses. And it's apparently been there since the home was built and it's still there today. So that's kind of cool. It's been sitting there all that time. This, this is uh, Kilmaine too. So this, was, this is a home out on Weishi Road. And it's thought that it was um, 
either built by uh, the Trundle family or the Young family. Um, Trundles also built places like Annington just down the road um, and were, were really wealthy as a result of the wheat boom that took place here um, in kind of the transition from tobacco to wheat right around 1800. So they had a, a, a lot of wealth stemming out of that um, where they were able to, to fund some of these, these home building projects. Um, the other theory is that maybe the Youngs who came down to these parts from Hagerstown in 1812, they built East Oaks in the 1820s. Um, they may have had a hand in building this, although we think this home was built around 1812. So I actually think it was that window is a little bit too tight um, for it to have been built by the Youngs, um, but it's possible, you know, one of them lived there at some point in time. Again, though, you know, pretty classic federal style. We can see as we're looking at it, kind of that, that front door with the, the side transom windows there. We see the symmetry across, um, if you, it's really hard to see here, but if you look really, really closely at the cornice where the, where the front wall hits the roof, you can see a little bit of kind of that tooth-like dental up, especially in the upper right part, um, which is really just kind of bricks turned outward to, to create that design element. So it's, I just think it's cool because it's one of those really, really little features that most people would not notice. And yet the builder still thought it was necessary to do, right? Because it's just, it's just that attention to detail, which is, which is, um, you know, fascinating to look at. And then, and then I've shown you, you know, previously, but here's the Veers uh, Stevens house, um, a little bit pulled out. And this is a, an even better shot of kind of that, that dental work on the, on the cornices. You can see where that roof line hits that front wall. Um, those bricks are kind of almost turned out in a little bit of a diagonal manner to, to create that kind of sawtooth effect, which I think is a really, really cool effect. Um, so the next time you're you're sitting there with coffee, you can kind of comment to your friends about how nice the, the dentals on the home are, um, and they'll have no idea what you're talking about, probably. And then the Dr. Thomas Pool House, which is, of course, right in the center of town. This is another really classic textbook example of, of federal architecture built in the 1840s. It's got the side transom windows. It's got the fan light above the top. It's got that symmetry taking place. Um, this, you know, this home has a lot of interesting design elements that most don't. Um, it's got the fan light for the attic, which is, which is interesting. It's got the, um, the aproned chimneys on the side, and then it's got these dormers, which, which I think are original to the home. Um, so it has a, a lot of really kind of above and beyond features, um, that, that make it, um, uh, really fascinating. And then. East Oaks, just because I felt like I couldn't go through these styles without mentioning it, just because it is such a um, another case of a, of a place that is that is brought up frequently as um, an example of just very high end um, architectural design. Um, again, built in the federal the federal style, you can see the the um, transom windows to the sides and above. You can see the lintels above the, the windows. Um, there is some some cornice detail in there. It's just hard to see with the shadows here. Um, but again, it's it's kind of those very classic um, uh, federal style you know details here. I, I think if you wanted to argue that this is a Georgian look, you could probably make that argument too. Um, I, I suppose they consider it to be federal based on the year it was built, which was the late 1820s, and also maybe some of the interior design elements. Okay, so as we move towards the the middle parts of um, the 1800s, we start to um, transition into some some different um, kind of new not not necessarily new for America, but um, innovative architectural styles um, with some some looks that are quite different and and provide a little bit more flair than kind of that that federal symmetric um, appearance of, of some of the older homes. And so the first style that I want to talk about was the Italianate style. And you can see there in, in, in the definition, you know, it's coming um, as a reaction to the rigid formalism um, that had come to dominate 19th century architecture, which I think is kind of a reference to, you know, the, the federal and, and Georgian work. And the Italianate style, I think, is best embodied here in the Ag Reserve by, by Rocklands, um, built in 1870 by Benoni Allnuts. And 
they they really kind of took the the list of you know what makes an italianate style house and they checked off all the details i mean it really hits kind of all the points all the characteristics um and, and so what we have here a couple of things that are very stereotypical italianate so the first is these these rounded windows it's it's a little bit hard to tell in these pictures I mean, you can kind of see that the tops of these windows have a little bit of a round shape to them i'll tell you that when you're standing closer to the house or inside the house and looking out it's it's much more obvious when you're up close but they are rounded tops we have um these coins that i that i mentioned earlier um they're, they're it's hard to see in the in the seneca standstone here but if you're up close to this home at any point which you can walk right up to if you're out at the uh, the winery you'll see that the the blocks there on the on the corners are much larger and really kind of um, perfectly cut there on the ends um, to, to lay kind of that that structure. We have the the double door entry, which is kind of a, a pretty classic Italianate style um, choice, as opposed to when we were looking at federal and Georgian, which is just that single normally paneled door. And then one of the things that that um, Italianate builders really liked was the bracketed cornices so where we see that front wall hit the hit the roof line we've got these brackets that are i believe just ornamental in style i don't think they're actually supporting any weight um but but give it kind of a, an interesting unique look and if you think about how small the cornices were on on places like um, the beer stevens house and you can see how how big they are here you know they're really a really kind of prominent design element hard to miss and then the other pieces of, of italianate homes that are common is normally we have this very low pitched roof, you know, so you, when you're looking at the front of an Italianate structure, you're not going to see much of the roof line because it's relatively, it's much flatter than, than some of the, the Georgian and federal homes. And then uh, a cupola up top, um, I've heard it referred to as a, a widow's walk, but it's essentially kind of a, a platform. It can be exposed like it is here at Rocklands or it can be enclosed, but it's a platform um, that you can you can go up to and, and peer out over your land uh, with and, and I'll tell you and I know this from personal experience that this is not just a design element right so if you go in if you look at some new houses even here in pools if you go to Seneca Chase for example some of the homes have this as kind of a design feature on the roof but it's not actually accessible here it is if you go into the attic at Rocklands there is a small ladder that opens to a, a hatch up here and you can stand up here and look out over the entire Rocklands um, kind of you know land um, and, and so it's a it's a it's an amazing um, viewpoint um, but but very much a, a usable one so so this is this is another example um, this is Bon Secours it's it's actually in the eastern part of the Ag Reserve so this is not one that I've talked about much before and to be frank I don't know a ton about it because I just haven't dug into that part of the reserve quite yet so it's out out towards like Brookville, kind of in the eastern part of the county. Um, but I really, I love the way this home looks. And it, it, this is a good example of a home that certainly is Italianate in detail. I mean, if you look at these, these just amazingly large rounded windows here on the sides and then these smaller, skinnier ones in the middle, um, they're, they're very stereotypical Italianate. But clearly there are other features here. There's a little bit of Victorian um architecture going on there's maybe a little little bit of even gothic stuff taking place there's almost kind of a a federal style front to it right so there's a lot of different design elements um occurring here and i just wanted to kind of show how they can be blended together but i just you know i think these windows are are so cool i wanted to show this picture and then this is the the lewis selman house this is a home out in in the comus area and this is another example where you have on, on one hand, if we look at kind of the cornice work and the roof line, it's very Italianate in nature and gives the whole home kind of an, an Italianate feel. But actually, if we look at the home and we look at the windows and the way the structure is laid out, it's it's kind of it's really just a, a large block. It's more federal in nature, right? So again, we kind of have this this combining of elements um, in in this structure. Okay, so. Around the same time that um, these Italianate homes were, were going up, and there's there's not that many in the area. Like I said, there's more kind of small Italianate features. There's Rocklands is relatively unique. 
Um, but around that same time, what we also had was um, builders and carpenters coming in on some of these homes and um, either building um, completely Gothic style homes, which I don't know of any in the Ag Reserve, um, but instead what we have is a bunch of homes that featured a lot of um, Gothic type features um, to the structures. And it's really kind of a, a design element that is um, reflecting, as you can see here, kind of the medieval design. Um, if we think about Gothic in terms of Europe, we th a lot of, I think of like Paris, I think of cathedrals and gargoyles and flying buttresses. It's kind of a nod to that, but, but in a very much more kind of toned down fashion. And so I think the absolute best um, example of this that exists is the Nathan Dickerson Pool House built in 1870. Um, this is out towards Edwards Ferry. This is a picture of the home, I think from around the 1910s, 1920s. Unfortunately, a lot of this Gothic styling is no longer on the home, okay? So when we look at this, there's a whole lot of things taking place here. And I so wish or hope that somebody in the future kind of brings it back to this house because I think it's amazing. I also just love this picture because you've got what looks like these four kind of younger girls standing on the porch and then it looks like an older man kind of sitting in the chair behind them. So there's some fascinating story to them looking out at this person taking the picture. Um, and also note the, the uh, water tower off there on the left, which is also fascinating. But when we think about the Gothic elements here, we have these very, very steep gabled roof lines. We have these um, really interesting features called finials, which are essentially like these almost, um, you know, small, um, like pole, totem pole type structures, <coughs> design elements sitting on top of the gables. We have um, this cross bracing across, across the, uh, the gables, which is really fascinating. If you look at that, it's a really interesting look. Um, I, I, and I, well, they're gone now. So I got to believe that they are purely ornamental. They weren't in any way kind of keeping loads together. Um, we have the, the coins down on the left-hand side. You can see them there. Um, they're they're kind of harder to see in the black and white. And then we have on the porch, this very kind of decorative, almost Gothic style trim. So, I mean, this, this place really is, I, I just think this picture is such an interesting picture, but um, it, it really hits a lot of kind of Gothic elements that I don't think you can find on pretty much any other home, um, at least in, in this part of the Ag Reserve. An another one that I just wanted to, to show is um, St. Peter's Church here in Poolsville. I don't think that the church in and of itself is necessarily Gothic in nature, but one really strong characteristic of um, Gothic structures is pointed windows. And this, is, I was trying to think of like, where do, where have I seen pointed windows before? I, I think this is the only structure that immediately comes to mind where the windows not only are around it, but they actually come to a point at the top. And so I just wanted to point that out as like an interesting little design element uh, at St. Peter's that you probably pass by, you know, on a almost daily basis um, out there. Um, so yeah, so there's they're not a ton with the Gothic elements. They're they're mostly mixed into other styles, but just wanted to kind of highlight it is really kind of a, a cool feature that is hard to find. So if you know of any houses with cool Gothic features, let me know. I'd love to love to see them. And then the Victorian style, which I think when we think about um, a lot of the older farmhouses in the area. I think, and, and I think there's, you know, there's a ton of these homes, especially these homes with kind of these, these um, center gables that are really steep and steep roof lines. Um, that's really being built in the Victorian style named for, for Queen Victoria. And we see them kind of in a, in a lot of different places. So this is Lindenwood. This is, I think one of my favorite homes. Not completely sure. We think it's built somewhere between 1850 and 1870. Um, but what we have when we look at this is, again, we have kind of these these steep roof lines with with the center gable, um, and that I think is is really kind of the the clear Victorian element here. But then there's a whole bunch of other features that kind of tie into some of those other architectural styles, right? So we have these bracketed cornices as kind of a design element under the on the cornice, which is which is fascinating. 
we have the attic window kind of got this this round curve in kind of a, an Italian aid style. And then we have these transom windows in a very kind of almost federal look. So we, we have this really beautiful home that I think is very nicely um, incorporated a bunch of different kind of architectural styles or evolutions over the years into, into one home. We also have, have the Evans home, which is you know right there in the center of town. I mean, if we look at, at this home and we look at um, Lindenwood, incredibly similar, a little bit less detail work. We don't have you know, that, that um, bracketed cornice work taking place, but we still have that very high, steep front gable. We've got the rounded attic window here. We've got some um, kind of interesting trim work around the front porch. I don't know if that's original to the home, but um, it's almost a little bit in a, in a Gothic style. Um, so again, transom windows on the front. So a lot of these design elements mixing, but this is, you know, pretty, um, pretty stereotypical of what we're seeing in Victorian farm homes uh, in this part of the Ag Reserve. Here's another one. This is the John Williams home. This is out in the Martinsburg area. Um, again, smaller gable. We've got that rounded window in the attic there. Um, central front door with, with transom lights. And then what's interesting on this one is these two windows right next to either side of the front door are actually elongated down, um, which is an interesting element that I haven't seen other places. But but so what I think is kind of cool is while a lot of these homes are Victorian in nature and at, at first glance look very similar, as we spend a little bit more time looking at each one individually, we start to see these small differences that emerge. And, and you see this on the interior of homes as well. You'll see very similar you know, um, styles of, you know, stair railings, for example. Um, but as you start to really look at them, you'll see that there are some, some differences. And a lot of times what that accounts for is, you know, just single or a couple of builders going around to the same homes um, and, and doing their work in a very similar manner to other ones that they've done, but leading, leaving a little bit of a, a different take on their work each time, right? So we have this, this result of these effects that are, that are similar, but still different. Okay, so that's all I've got for tonight. Um, I'm more than willing to take any questions if you all have any. Feel free at this time to either leave your questions in the chat or unmute to ask them. I see that Mr. Poole has put in the chat that the John Poole house has two styles of notching in its construction. The lower section is called the diamond notch, while the upper level is a V notch showing the upper floor was added later. You can see the notched out for the floor rafters was also moved to give more headroom. I've only seen the diamond notch in old log buildings around Elizabethan and Gaithersburg. Hmm. Yeah. Very cool. It's always cool when someone shares their own knowledge about local history or some of the cool buildings in our area. And I personally thought it was really cool to really see like the style breakdown. I know like when I travel to other areas in the country, it's really easy to pick out how their architecture is styled and different than here, but it's hard to view some place that you see every day in the same way. So very cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's cool too, like, I think just to be able to get a sense pretty quickly and looking at a place of probably when around it was built, right? And so like, if you're looking at like, um, a place like, um, like the, the Evans home down here, you know, I, I know that it was built in 1885. But because if you if you know kind of Victorian area, Victorian era and whatnot, you would know if somebody asked you that it was not built like in 1840 and that it was also not built in 1910 or 1920, just because of the features, it kind of falls into this window. I also see a comment in the chat that the all that Darby house behind the pool store has front windows that go to the floor of the front yep. porch. Yep, that's right. You're right, Jim. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Feel free to unmute and ask any questions you have at this time. I'm curious what your favorite of all of the styles are. I don't know. I mean, I, I, so your favorite elements. I think these like Gothic elements here are amazing. Um, just because they're so 
unique looking. Um, but I actually think I've come to really just like almost bordering on obsession with um, Inverness and with just the simplicity of it. Um, I, I, I like quickly mentioned, but um, the other day I had somebody reach out and they said to me um, that their family had, um, I, well, they were, she was tied to the, to the whites, the, the white family. Um, and she, she said, you know, I've got this kind of this book of, of old pictures of Inverness. I don't really know what to do with it. You know, I don't want to lose them, but like, can you, can I send you copies? And I was like, absolutely. And so I just got this treasure trove of amazing old pictures like this one um, from, from the forties of, of just this really cool home. And so that's, I, I don't know, there's something about it that I just think maybe it's the setting as well, but I, I think this is probably my favorite at the moment. Part of it's also that I haven't been able to actually go out and visit Inverness. So maybe it's like, you know, you're always interested in what you can't quite get to. So maybe that's part of it. But, um, but this for me is, is the one right now. Yeah, the symmetry is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I see a question in the chat that says, I recall your presentation on Windermere. Mm -hmm. What style is that? And has there been any progress in restoring it? Yeah, um, great question. So Windermere is really an interesting. So Windermere, for those that don't know, is a is an old home out in the Boyd's area. Um, it's been abandoned for a long time. Um, it was built, I, I want to say it was built in the 1890s. It's right around turn of the century. Um, and there's an, an individual who is purchasing the home with hopes to restore it. I mean, and when I say abandoned, I mean, it's like abandoned and like a, a strong breeze away from falling down. I mean, it's, it's in bad shape. It's got graffiti all over it. It's, it's really rough. Um, but he, he is, in the process of purchasing it with the intent to restore it. The challenge that he's having is it sits, um, its driveway is also the access road for the dam out there on that, that big man-made lake uh, in Boyd's. And there's a little bit of a kind of back and forth with um, Washington um, sewer and water about access and some other ground issues in, in that region. And so they're in a little bit of a battle to figure out how that's gonna get resolved. So it's it's really messy. I haven't I haven't talked to him in a little bit, um, but um, I see Glenn raising his hand. He might know more. Um, go ahead, Glenn. No, I, I have another question coming. Oh, okay. Um, so, but to, to answer the, the first part of this, so Windermere, I, I, I think it's, it's largely Victorian, but it's also um, Queen Anne style. So we didn't talk about Queen Anne just because there's not quite as many, um, but Queen Anne is like kind of a, an evolution, I think of Victorian. It's got a lot of like um, kind of rounded turns and, and porches and stuff. I think a really, really good example of a Queen Anne home that's really easy to see is if you um, go out to Barnesville and you're at that T intersection. Um, if you're kind of looking at this, the, the T, um, you're looking straight ahead and they've got, I think it's Mrs. Brown's attic is that store. If you look right to your right, there's a big white house in Queen Anne style. Um, and, and I think that's the same as Windermere. Go ahead, Glenn. Um, I was going to um, bring up that I was on a tour a couple years ago with um, a local historian, Garrett Peck. And uh, he was talking about the Seneca um, quarry but he was bringing up the fact that a lot of the homes that were built that you've just covered tie into the construction era down in Georgetown. Um, a lot of the styles were, uh, a lot of these people were trading, uh, they were in the trade with Georgetown and they would be seeing these homes being built down there. And they're like, it was, seems very peculiar that you would see a Georgetown style home sitting in the middle of the Ag Reserve. And it just, yeah. That's why we're seeing them. It's it's not that these people went off to Europe and came back yep. and um, said, "Oh, I'm going to build a mansion." They were seeing these styles right in their own backyard yep. in Georgetown, um, and they were inspired and they could afford it. So that, that it's just unique that you yep. know this area is seeing this and there's that they're surviving like they do in Georgetown. Yeah, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Um, and I, I think the most the best example of that is. 
um, the Peters family, which was uh, descendants of, I think, Martha Washington. And they, they had um, Tudor Place built in Georgetown, which I think is like a place you can tour now. Yes. But they also then, I guess, wanted to, a summer home. And so they built Monte Video, which is out there on, on River Road, right across the street from Seneca Schoolhouse. Um, in the federal style, but it's exactly as Glenn has, has described. It, it looks like a, a little bit miniature and not quite as ornate version of Tudor Place in Georgetown, but still an amazingly uh, beautiful home. Um, but yeah, they, they were, you know, they were seeing things down there and, and bringing, bringing back these ideas. Um, and then I see Steve's comment. Um, uh, thanks for uh, the positive comments um, for for the the house next to the Darby store in Bellsville yeah so so that one um, I've been inside that one um, it, it's I think it's built around 1910 or 1920 and I know that the county owns it and they're actually they've been in there recently doing some restoration work I know they had torn out all the floors and replaced them and restored them um, they're really doing a, a good job in there of, of getting it back to its kind of original design um, and I'm not sure exactly what the county's long-term plan is about it. Um, it's, a, it's a home, so I wanna do another tour here soon in the spring, and that's a place that I would like to do if the county will let me. I think, it'll do, I think they would, it's just gonna be up to like if they have construction going on in there or not. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool home. If you go to my website, which I will, um, I will type into this chat here right now. Uh, you go there um, and you'll see a, a property explorations tab. You'll, you'll see that home as one of the houses and, and I, I have a bunch of interior pictures of it. Um, it has a huge, huge attic. It's like one of the biggest attics I've ever seen. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's like almost, it's kind of, a craftsman type detail on the, on the interior, a lot of like exposed woodwork, but, um, but yeah, I'm not sure what the long-term plans are, but, but definitely a, a beautiful house. Any more questions? Feel free to unmute. I'm also going to be putting the link to Kenny's historic ag reserve properties, Facebook page in the chat. If you'd like to check it out and give it a yeah. like and follow. Yeah, please do. I'm trying to put a lot of stuff on there. I'm also on um, Instagram at Historic Ag Reserve. Well, if we have no further questions, I would just like to say, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's presentation as much as I did and learned something new about architecture in our own backyard. If you think of any questions you have, as always, you can email us later at info at poolsvilleseniors.org. If you'd like to unmute or turn on your camera now to say goodbye, now's the time. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, please leave a like and a comment. We'd like to thank Kenny for his presentation, as well as our ongoing sponsors and private contributors that help us keep our programs going because we love putting them on for you. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider joining us for more upcoming events We'll be back this time next week with the Riches of Richmond. And as always, you can go to our website, poolsvillesingers.org, for more info and registration for all of our events. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a good night and happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Kenny, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.